welcome back to the revision class for the upcoming UGC net English and this class is presented by Professor Academy Chennai in today's class we are going to look at drama its growth and development across ages and let's begin with the Greek origin of drama theater we are told began as a theater festival in the Greek city of Athens during summer every year they had festivals theater festivals and why these festivals they had these festivals in honor of god dionysius god of wine because during summer they harvested grapes so it was a wine making festival a harvest festival so during this pe uh, period people celebrated this uh, harvest with a competition a theater festival and we have this word Agon, A-G-O-N. Agon means contest. And Agon is a key word because this word is available in protagonist. When you say protagonist, right? Protagonist is a primary contestant. So from this word, we also get theater. In a sense, there are a lot of people, contestants coming to this festival and they put on their place. Where? In theater of Dionysius and famous playwrights were invited to put on their place in front of this crowd. And at the end of the festival, the best play and the best playwright were awarded. So this is how theater began in the West, especially the Greek city of Athens. And when we think of Greek playwrights, think of these five. Number one, Aeschylus. Aeschylus is considered the founder of Greek tragedy or the father of Greek tragedy. His best known play, Prometheus Bound, based on the Greek mythology. Prometheus who stole fire from God Zeus and gave it to human beings. Because of this act, Prometheus was bound to a mountain where every day an eagle comes and eats his liver. And the very next day, the, his liver grows back. Again, the eagle comes and eats his liver. So this is an eternal punishment given to Prometheus. And this is his famous work, Prometheus Bound. But Easter is also known for his trilogy called the Orestia Trilogy. There are three plays when we say trilogy. The first one is Agamemnon, based on... Uh, Homer's Iliad. But there are also two other plays. So your job, find out the other two plays in this trilogy. The first one is Agamemnon. What are the two other plays in the Orestia trilogy? Let me know in the comment section. Then we have Sophocles, another tragedian. His famous work or a collection of works, Theban plays. Again, we have three works. The first one is, or not the first one, but the famous one, we have Oedipus Rex. Rex, R-E-X. Rex means king. When we say Oedipus Rex, King Oedipus. And we know this play which is often prescribed in which we have Oedipus who is fated to kill his father, Laius, and fated to marry his own mother, Jocasta. And it ends in tragedy. Based on this work, we have the Austrian neurologist, Sigmund Freud, who came up with a concept, a psychological concept called Oedipal complex, referring to the bond between, or the love bond between son and mother. So that's a concept he derived from this play. There are two other plays in this uh, category or in this under uh, Theban plays. What are they? So one is Sophoc uh, Oedipus Rex, what are the two other plays under Theban plays? Let me know this uh, name of the place. Next, we have Euripides. So when we say Euripides, his plays are based on women, kind of women-centric plays. It doesn't mean that um, he portrayed them as powerful characters, but most of his uh, plays were uh, based on mythical women. So we have Medea, Electra. We also have concepts like uh, Electra complex, but this uh, concept was uh, put forward by Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Jung. 
yung J U N G. Here we talk about the bond between daughter and father. There in uh, Oedipal complex, we talked about the bond between son and mother. That was put forward by Sigmund Freud, and this was put forward by Carl Jung. And when we say Greek tragedians, these are the three Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. And whenever you want to remember a writer, remember them with the work they have written. For instance, Aeschylus, Prometheus Bound, Sophocles, Oedipus Rex, Euripides, Medea, or Electra. Next, uh, let's go to Greek comedians, or in the sense, not comedians, playwrights known for their comedies. We have Aristophanes. Aristophanes is called the father of Greek comedy. This playwright is known for making fun of public figures and criticizing uh, public events. And in this work, The Clouds, um, he makes fun of Socrates, the philosopher, and his method of teaching. And in another work, uh, The Frogs, where uh, he makes fun of Euripides, the playwright. Because in this play, The Frogs, we have God Dionysius, God of wine. He's very upset because Euripides is dead. So he visits the underground in the guise of, uh, he disguises himself as Hercules. He goes underground, hates H-A-D-E-S. He wants to bring back Euripides so that the people of Athens uh, could be taught the values of life. But once he goes there, there is a competition between Aeschylus and Euripides. In that competition, Aeschylus wins. And God Dionysius understands Aeschylus is superior to Euripides. So he brings back Aeschylus to the earth. So that's how the play ends. So Aristophanes is associated with old comedy. When we say old comedy, where the public figures or public events or social events are criticized, right? On the other hand, we have new comedy. When we say new comedy, we think of Menander. This differs from the earlier comedy because in new comedy, the focus is not public affairs or public events. The focus is more on everyday affairs of common people and their follies, right? And we have examples, Aspis, A-S-P-I-S, uh, in English, the shield. Then we have uh, discolos, which, uh, which means misanthrope, one who hates humankind. Okay. So these are the Greek dramatists you should remember. Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Aristophanes, and Menander. So with this, let's go to late medieval drama. Now we started off with Greek origin. Now we are moving to Europe. When we say Europe, theater began in the late medieval period. When we say the medieval period, it refers to fifth, uh, the period between fifth and 15th century. When we say late medieval period, it refers to 14th and 15th century. And drama began in Europe with liturgical drama. What is liturgical drama? We have to understand the word liturgy, L-I-T-U-R-G-Y. It refers to the ritual form of worship in the church. In church, during masses, the Christian mass, the priest and the congregation, they have a kind of a chanted dialogue, passages from the Bible. And those passages were sung or chanted like dialogues between the priest or the celebrant and the congregation. And this drama happened within the church. So this is considered the origin of drama in Europe, liturgical drama. From this, we have the development. We have religious plays, like mystery play, miracle, and morality plays. When we say mystery plays, the plays were based on the Bible, a scene from a Bible the resurrection of Christ, right? That's That could be one of the themes. And why it's called mystery? Mystery here, here uh, has nothing to do with uh, you know, something enigma. 
something mysterious. No, mystery here refers to the trade guilds, G-U-I-L-D-S, traders who sponsored this place. So during Christmas or Easter, the traders of a particular town, you know, they sponsored this place or in their honor, this place were performed, okay? So that's why these places are called mystery place. We have an example, Wakefield place, place uh, which survived or which were put on uh, in a place called Wakefield. Next, we have miracle place. Miracle place based on the lives of or legends of saints who supposed to perform miracles. So that's, you know, with this, you know, if you know some clues to remember the name, okay, mystery trade guild based on the Bible, miracle refers to the miracles performed by saints. We have a play, a French play called Miracles of Notre Dame. So that's an example of miracle plays. Then we have morality plays. Morality plays are like allegories. What is an allegory? When we say allegory, there are two layers of stories. On the surface level, it's more like a fable. On the deeper level, characters uh, become symbols. They stand for a quality. They stand for good, evil, or liars, or truth teller, for some quality or some feature of man, human, <coughs> humankind. So we have uh, a play called Everyman, which is a significant morality play. So these are the famous plays and these are the beginning of plays, theater in Europe. And we have this famous example, the tragical history of the life and death of Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe in England during the Elizabethan age, which is an example of morality play because we have characters like uh, good angel, bad angel. They warn Dr. Faustus not to sell his soul for 24 years to Satan, Lucifer. And this, is, this can be considered a morality play. Next, let's go to Senecan tragedy. Senecan tragedy is a revenge tragedy, a tragedy full of blood, right? And why it is called a Senecan tragedy? Because it is named after the Roman playwright Seneca, whose plays were mostly based on the theme of revenge, vengeance, right? Spilling blood of the enemy. So we have examples like Hercules, Medea, or Thesistis. So based on this, we have the famous play, Gorbodok. Gorbodok is considered the first English tragedy written in blank verse. 1561, it was by Norton and Sackville. So what is the plot of Gorbodok? We have a king named Gorbodok, king of Britain, his wife, Videna, queen, their children, Ferex and Porex. Ferex, elder son, Porex, younger son. What happened? There, there was a dispute between Ferex and Porex. In the dispute, Porex, the younger son, killed Ferex, the elder son. And queen was very fond of the elder son, Ferex. So she killed Porex. And because of this violent deaths, the mob, the people of Britain, they revolted against the king and the queen. They killed the king and the queen. And because of this, the nobility or the nobles, they fought against the common people. So it became a civil war. There were a lot of bloodshed. So this is how the play ends with a civil war in England. And when we think of uh, revenge tragedy, there should be blood, there should be a murder, there should be revenge. And these are the, uh, this is a list of plays when we think of English Senecan tragedies. The first one, very famous one, Thomas Kidd, a kind of a pioneer for pioneer of Senecan tragedies in England. We have the Spanish tragedy where you have a father, Hieronimo, who wants to take revenge for the death of his son, Horatio. 
and we have a girl bellimperia who wants to take revenge for the death of uh, her lover andrea and they put on a play play within a play to achieve that end next we have shakespeare and his famous play hamlet which is almost based on the uh, spanish tragedy because we also have a play within a play in hamlet what is the name of the play within a play in hamlet let me know the answer in the comment section there are two possible answers one we have the murder of gonzago that is another because the play is adapted by the character hamlet for the stage what is the other name for the play play within the play so we have murder of gonzago it's also called what then we have john webster's the duchess of malfi and cyril twarner's the atheist tragedy he has also written the revenge tragedy because we are not sure whether it was written by him or it was attributed to cyril twarner then we have a bloody play written by shakespeare which is also a senecan tragedy titus andronicus so what you have to do if you are preparing for uh, exams like ugc net or any competitive exam you have to read at least the plots of these plays so that when you get questions you can eliminate options okay next comedy of manners comedy of manners they make fun of the follies of the upper class the manners of the men and women of the upper class right and because they make fun of the behavior of the upper class it uh, the plays um, are based on for humor uh, they are based on witty dialogues exchanges or repartee r e p a r t e e it's a technique used in drama uh, where we have two or more characters who indulge in uh, a kind of a war game word game a uh, kind of a rapid war game so you say one sentence and the other character say another sentence very short sentences it's a kind of a quick fire session goes on and down right and it also involves word games like a pun a metaphor and others and in england we have uh, comedy of manners early examples we have shakespeare's love's labor's lost much ado about nothing and you should know the plot of love's labor's lost which is funny in the sense we have a king a prince uh, and his uh, three friends they take vows that not to speak to any women so that is their vow but when a french princess along with uh, her uh, three um, you know a uh, three friends come now their resolution is challenged so without the knowledge of the other they fall in love with the girls what happens and this is the premises of this play love's labor's lost but when we say comedy of manners it began in france with the, the famous writer moliere m o l i e r e this is his pen name his original name jean baptist poquelin j e a n jean baptist uh, p is silent in the middle b a p t i s t e then p o q u e l i n jean baptist poquelin his work the doctor in spite of himself the french title le médecin malgré lui so when we think of uh, comedy of manners we should go to france for uh, examples then we come to england there are a lot of plays especially the period when we say restoration period the plays most of the plays put on during this period or comedy of manners we have examples we have to read at least a few works uh, by these writers we have george etrich the comical revenge then william wisherley's the country wife john banbrook's the provoked wife then very significant play william conkrives the way of the bird you should know the plot of this play next one george forquarts the beobs the buse strat strat stratagem then we have oliver goldsmith it's a masterpiece she stoops to conquer you can get questions like 
she in the title refers to whom? Or you have a very famous character, a uh, comic character in this play, Tony Lumpkin. So because of him, you know, within a single night, there are a lot of mistaken identities and confusion. So read this play, She Stoops to Conquer. And you should also read Richard Sheridan's The Rivals and The School for Scandal. Next, let's go to Closet Drama. What is a Closet Drama? You should uh, remember, during the Puritan age, theaters were closed. We are uh, talking about 17th century. 1642, theaters were closed in England because Puritans came to power. England became a republic for the first time, Commonwealth. So co during the Commonwealth period, theaters were closed. Uh, though theaters were closed, people wrote drama, but not for performance, but for private reading. If a play is written for, is meant for reading, then it is called closet drama. We have the famous example, John Milton's Samson Agonistus. I hope you remember the word agon because we began this class with the word agon. Agon means contest. In Greek or in the city of, in the Greek city of Athens, they put on plays. They had theater festivals, theater, theater contests, right? Similar way, agon means contest. So Samson Agonistus means Samson the contestant or Samson the wrestler, or Sam Samson the champion. There are a lot of uh, translation for this single word. And Milton called this dramatic poem, a dramatic poem meant for reading, a closet drama based on the Bible, Samson, published in uh, 1671 along with Paradise Regent. Here is a question for you. How many books are there in John Milton's Paradise Regained? Next. These are some of the famous uh, closet drama. You have Lord Byron's Manfred, Thomas Hardy, we have the Dinas. And during the Romantic age, there are a lot of closet dramas. Example, we have Shelley, Shelley's Prometheus Unbound. So what comes to your mind when I say Prometheus Unbound? Which Greek playwright comes to your mind? East Chilis, I hope. Aeschylus, known for his famous play, Prometheus Bound. So you have to remember names like this. Aeschylus, Prometheus Bound. Shelley, Prometheus Unbound. Shelley's wife, Mary Shelley, came up with a Gothic novel called Frankenstein. What is the subtitle of Frankenstein? Which has something to do with Prometheus. So now you can remember Aeschylus, Shelley, and Mary Shelley and their works. I also have a few questions for you. During the Romantic age, Wordsworth, Coleridge, of course, Shelley and Keats, they also wrote plays. What is the only play written by Wordsworth? Or what is the closet drama written by? We have Coleridge and also Keats. Find out them and let me know. Next, problem plays. What are problem plays? Plays which address social issues social problems and before we go to that i have to make sure that you understand the difference between problem plays associated with shakespeare that is different and this is different problem plays of shakespeare refer to shakespeare's plays which are problems in the sense we don't know how to classify them whether they are tragedies or comedies or tragic comedies but these plays are different these plays address social issues. So we have the famous playwright, Norwegian playwright, Henrik Ibsen, who is called the father of modern drama. Why the father of modern drama? Because modern drama focuses on social issues and social problems. One of the significant plays, uh, Doll's House. In Doll's House, we have Nora, a housewife, who borrowed some money for uh, her husband, Helmer. When Helmer was sick, she borrowed money. But there was a rule that women should not borrow money without the knowledge of their husband. 
but nora did why to save her husband's life but when this truth comes out when the secret comes out because nora didn't uh, reveal this to her husband and in order to get money from a money lender croxton she also forged the sign of her father and when everything comes to uh, to the knowledge of her husband and he criticized her and he was also relieved because they came out of that uh, situation because of this uh, trickery and other things from crockster crockster's blackmail and helmer said i am saved nora asked how about me because helmer said i am saved and nora said how about me am i not included in your i then helmer said yes yes we are saved then nora understood that he is more self centric then she said i am going to leave this house and he asked uh, what about your holy duties you have a lot of duties to perform and helmer's definition do i need to tell you that you know tell you your holy duties your duties to your husband and your children these are your holy duties as a wife then nora said no i have a duty to myself so very famous scene in the history of theater she shuts the door to helmer's face and she leaves the house at that time you know a wife leaving the house a husband's house was unthinkable and this was the first play which portrayed that where a woman takes a decision and she wants to lead a life of her own and this is nora and with this we have problem plays social problems a uh, plays addressing social problems famous one when we think of social problems i mean uh, problem plays george bernard shaw george bernard shaw <coughs> was a great fan of henry ibsen so he read the plays of henry ibsen even he came up with a book on henry ibsen quint essence of ibsenism in which uh, you can read the critical analysis of ibsen's plays by bernard shaw so uh, bernard shaw one of the problem plays we have mrs warren's profession so profession in those days refers to prostitution so here it is a tussle between a mother and a daughter the mother was a former prostitute so that's the context of the play and these are the some of the famous uh, problem plays we have ibsen another play an enemy of the people then we have john galsworthy strife strife uh, the context is um, we have factory workers who go on a strike against the owners uh, the factory is in in the welsh english border on the border next we have lillian helmer the children's hour then author millers all my sons next let's go for expressionist drama expressionism expressionism is a literary movement which came against two other literary movements called realism and naturalism when we say realism they focused on of course like uh, plays like uh, ibsen's plays or bernard shaw's plays those are realist plays focusing on social problems naturalism when we say naturalism plays by uh, plays written in france or we have emil zola the foremost spokesperson of french drama i mean french naturalism what is naturalism here naturalism is the extended version of realism focusing more on reality in minute detail so expressionism came against these uh, realism and naturalism the focus is more on the inner reality of characters rather than on the exterior reality of society so when we say reality people talk about social events or how characters behave and their exterior reality but expressionism focused on the inner reality of characters how people perceive the world what goes on in their mind it's like a stream of consciousness uh, we can draw parallels between expressionism and uh, stream of consciousness novels written by virginia wolf james joyce and others 
where they focused on how characters perceive reality and in order to convey that reality which is a distorted in their mind writers used symbols images dream sequences or dreams or with the language a distorted language fragmentary language so these are some of the features of expressionism and in order to convey the inner reality of characters our playwrights depended more on the gestures and body language of the actors to express those uh, uh, the inner reality so that's why it's called expressionism and we have examples like uh, the ghost sonata by august strindberg then we have a list of works elmer rice the adding machine eugene oil the emperor jones then shano kazi the silver tazi and you should read the work by eugene oil the harry ape in which we have a character called yank y a n k he is a stoker a stoker in a ship one who uh, feeds uh, the boiler with coal right a stoker and one day a girl a rich girl the daughter of a rich man a steel company owner she comes or uh, she visits that uh, hole you know she goes to that stoker's place and she looks at the people working there and she looks at yonk and calls him filthy beast and she faints and this these words hurt yonk so much so he wants to take revenge against the upper class especially the girl's uh, father and he is a steel company so he tries to join when he reaches new york he tries to join an organization he tries to bomb the steel company but nothing works at the end of the play uh, he visits a zoo where he looks at a gorilla in a cage and he feels one with that animal and he opens the cage of course uh, the gorilla uh, attacks him and puts him and breaks him and uh, crushes him to death so that's the end of this play and how the inner reality of this character who suffers a lot is portrayed through symbols there is a particular symbol we should concentrate on the rodin's thinker r o d i n this symbol comes again and again in this play the harry a rodin's thinker is a piece of sculpture where you see a person with um, uh, in a thinking posture with his elbow or or you know with his fist against his chin and thinking Uh, pensively and the same posture is used by uh yank and we call him uh the rodin's thinker in the play right so that is a symbol a uh, human being seems like a thinking being but ultimately a kind of a fragile uh being so that's how it is portrayed uh, that's how yank is portrayed in this work then we go uh, let's go to epic theater what do you mean by epic so when we say epic we think of the ramayana the mahabharata or we go for the iliad the odyssey so epic is a narration it's narration in the sense it tells a story right epic so that's the primary meaning epic means to narrate to tell a story or in the sense to tell the story of the society a uh, lot of stories in the society so let's go narration of social events so that's the meaning of epic or epic theater right it is associated with realism of course and when we say epic theater it was put forward by german playwright bertolt brecht and his famous work mother courage and her children and he used a technique called alienation effect or ver from dunks roman in short v effect or a effect alienation effect what is an alienation effect the, the term alienation is associated with marxism and brett was a marxist playwright in marxism alienation is a concept in the sense if a worker goes to work and workers do that work throughout the week again and again the same work after a period of time they feel alienated from what they do 
they think work is something i am different so they do the work they go away and we can feel this uh, detachment from the work whenever there is a holiday we feel relieved why because we see that as a mechanical work the bond between what we do the bond between the work and us is gone we feel alienated from what we do right so that is alienation so how a worker is alienated from his own work and what he or she produces similar way what we have to do in this play epic uh, theater brecht says we have to alienate in the sense we have to think of um, a term called karthasis in karthasis in a greek term what we have to do uh, aristotle says we have to feel one with the characters audience we you know we have to feel one with the fate of the character pity and fear but here we should not become one with the characters and the play we should be alienated from what is shown on the stage in the sense we should i mean audience should have a distance from what is shown on the stage and this distance from what is shown on the stage is essential to analyze what is portrayed on the play so this distance will help the audience to understand the social issue so this distance is you know uh, created by alienation effect so uh, for instance different music or use of placards or other interventions or character themselves reveal that they are characters kind of a meta theater elements and we have this work mother courage and her children it talks about war and the crimes of war and other issues associated with war so we have mother courage and her three children elif swiss cheese and catherine each one of them dies during the course of the war yet she has to go on she has to survive she has to pull her in a foot court and goes on and on next let's check out what brecht says about this theater it's all about breaking the fourth wall you know creating that alienation effect what is fourth wall think of a typical theater when you think of the stage you have three sides right and we are looking at the fourth side and that is the fourth wall we think as if we are looking into a house house with uh, think of a theater we have the wings two wings two sides and the background fourth third and the fourth is the screen i mean uh, we are looking into that house that should be broken we should detach ourselves from what is shown on the stage and brecht borrowed this uh, borrowed this concept from chinese theater alien this, this is a famous essay alienation effects in chinese acting this method is most recently used in germany for plays in a non aristotelian type why non aristotelian because aristotle says when you put on plays you know audience should connect themselves with the play but here we go against that so that's why it's called non aristotelian we should not feel empathy with the characters or the situation we have to detach or distance ourselves from what is portrayed and so that we can concentrate on the issues uh, depicted there and this is epic theater and this is what is expected of the audience next one theater of the absurd 1950s and 60s this theater ruled theater of the absurd what is absurd absurd is a concept where the, we think life is absurd life is meaningless we do something again and again and again and we we are bored of what we do and we think there is no meaning to this life and this mindset is portrayed in theater theater of the absurd the term before that it is based on philosophy a philosophy called existentialism and famous philosopher the french philosopher albert camus c a m u s and his work the myth of sisyphus think of the mythical character sisyphus what's his punishment he is punished with um, you know rolling a boulder a stone to the top of the mountain one once he reaches the top of the mountain again this boulder rolls down 
to the foot of the mountain. Again, he has to come down, pick it up, roll it up to the top. Again, it comes down. So this is his eternal punishment. Life is like that. It goes on and on. It repeats itself. We do the same thing again and again. And after a period of time, we are bored of it. So this is the absurd nature of human life. Simply put, the human existence is meaningless and futile. And whatever we do, I mean, the human endeavors, we end up, you know, we end up um, feeling bored or anxiety or anguish. That's the result of our endeavors. So this is the philosophy. We have uh, uh, philosophers like Albert Camus or Jean-Paul Sartre, S-C-R-T-R-E. And this is the crux of the theta, I mean, existentialism uh, said by Sartre. Existence precedes essence. Essence means meaning. Don't look for meaning in life. Just live your life. Existence. That matters a lot than essence. And the theta of the absurd, the term was coined by Martin Eslin in, the, in his book of the same name. And Martin Eslin brought together a group of writers who shared something in common in their works. Examples, we have Eugene Ionesco's The Chats. Very famous play where there is an old man and old woman. They are arranging chairs for a speaker to come and deliver a speech. And there are invisible characters who come and sit on the chairs. We don't know, but these old uh, women and uh, woman and man, they talk to these invisible characters. And they are just arranging the chats. Ultimately, towards the end of the play, yes, the speaker comes and he speaks. And before that, the old man and women, they jump out of the window and die. And the speaker, when he speaks, we understand that he can't speak. Right? And he makes some guttural noise. That's all. So the entire play looks absurd. And that's life. The chats. Then we have uh, Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, which is considered a masterpiece, a significant, a significant play under the theater of the absurd, Waiting for Godot. We have two characters, Vladimir and Estragon, Didi or Gogo. They wait for a person called Godot, but they don't know who Godot is. They have never seen Godot. They are not sure whether they are waiting for him in the right place. They are waiting under a tree. At the end of the play, a boy comes and tells them that Godot is not coming today, he is coming tomorrow. Okay, that is act one. Act two is the same. Of course, there are two other characters, Lucky and Pozo. Uh, owner who tries to sell uh, a slave in the market, Lucky and Pozo. And these are the characters, act one and act two. Looks almost as similar, waiting. The pain of waiting. And that's also a major theme in Theater of the Observe. Let me know what is the subtitle of Waiting for Goto, which is often asked. Next, we have Arthur Adamo, Ping Pong. Then Jean Genet, The Balcony. Harold Pinter, The Caretaker. Then Edward Alby, The Zoo Story. Zoo's story is an interesting work where we have two characters talking about their life, one talking about himself and his pet and other things, one with a comfortable family. And they are actually, at the end of the play, they are actually fighting for the bench they are sitting on. So what are the name of, uh, names of these two characters? Let me know. So let's check out Kitchen Zinc Drama. Kitchen Sink Drama. It uh, talks about the problems faced by the working class, especially the 50s and 60s British workers. They had to live in, in attics or you know very narrow space. Just, uh, that's a title, kitchen and sink. It's a cramped space where they have to uh, sleep, where they have to cook, where they have to live their life. And this place, when we say this, uh, it, it focuses on, uh, this place focus on the working class life of the late 50s and early 60s British life. And again here, workers, are, the characters portrayed here, they are disillusioned with, uh, disillusioned with modern society. And 
the place attack the established values of the middle class because there is no progress yet these workers are living in a pathetic situation and when we think of uh, kitchen sink drama here is a play john osborns look back in anger look back in anger we have characters who are angry about themselves and society we have a character called jimmy porter the protagonist of this book who is angry about his life or uh, how it is turning out to be and with his work and other things and we have a list of works where we have rebellious protagonists we have works like arnold wesker very important playwright under kitchen sink drama you should read uh, arnold wesker's roots and chicken soup with barley then we have uh, uh, sheila denali a taste of honey then alan owen the rough and ready lot so with this let's finish uh, today's class what we have done in this class we have looked at different forms of theater across ages and their famous uh, and the famous works and playwrights associated with each and every variety so what you have to do just go through all these plays and also answer the questions i asked and during the class so with this let's end today's class thank you so much please subscribe to professor academy's new channel exclusively for the students of english literature professor academy english that's the name of the channel and we offer courses for ugc net and set in tamil nadu we offer courses for ug trb pg trb polytechnic trb and tel and thank you so much see you tomorrow with another class on fiction this time